Shana Haba be Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem Over there, over there in the Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back to Theology in Perspective. I'm Dr. Daniel Woodhead, and I'm blessed that you could join us again today for our study of the Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when we left off in our last session, I had done a real quick recap of the progress that we've made through the book so far, and um, I introduced the concepts of the bowl judgments. Now, at the end of the trumpet judgments, the last trumpet opens the seven bowl or vile judgments. And I just want to touch on those again for a few moments here, and uh, then I'm going to do a, an interesting prelude, uh, I hope you agree, and uh, to the bowl judgments, and we'll go into them in a little more detail. But the first bowl that gets poured out on this earth causes sores on the flesh, but it only affects those that have taken the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, that 666 that allows them to conduct commerce, buy and sell and so on, and participate in the global economy. People that become believers during the tribulation will not take that mark, and therefore they won't be affected by this particular bowl judgment. The second bowl judgment causes the rest of the salt water on the earth to become ruined because it, it turns it to blood. And then the third bowl judgment causes the rest of the fresh water to turn to blood. So all the water is ruined. The fourth bowl judgment causes the heat of the sun to increase. The fifth bowl judgment causes the fourth worldwide total blackout. The sixth bowl judgment is associated with the campaign of Armageddon, and so is the seventh bowl judgment. That ends the Great Tribulation. Now, we will go into the campaign of Armageddon and its multiplicity of stages uh, in, a, in a later lesson. But today I want to talk about the prelude to the bowl judgments, and that's from Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, all the way through to the next chapter, 16, verse 1. I'm going to read some of that text for you, and then we will uh, uh, expand on it. Now, Revelation 15, 1 says, And I, remember this is the Apostle John now, saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now, Verse 1 is carrying on where Revelation chapter 11, verse 19 left off. And that was, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So you, you notice now that the temple is opened in heaven. We see the introduction of the seven angels that are in possession of the seven bowls. Some translations will call them vials. And they contain the wrath of God in his final judgment on the earth. The entire tribulation is God's wrath because he unleashes the Antichrist to take peace from the earth and bring disease and famine and earthquake and all kinds of things starting in first verse of Revelation chapter 6. So the text in 15 moves on here now. Verse 2 says, And I saw, as it were, a, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on this sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art only holy. 
for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now, now this is a view of the martyred saints from the second half of the Great Tribulation. They're in this victorious light of the presence of um, the, an or, excuse me, <laughs> they're in this victorious light regardless of the pressures of the Antichrist to worship him and take his mark. They lost their lives, but they're granted eternity. And that's characterized by the Lord's admonition from Matthew 10, 28. Because if you remember, the Lord Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now that's something for us to pay attention to. If you're a genuine born-again believer, you need to realize you're not staying here. You're going to the other side, and regardless of what happens to you here, don't fear those people that can harm your body. Don't fear them. Even if somebody kills you, it is to God that we're going and God that we owe our eternal gratitude to. Then they sing two songs here, and the first is called the Song of Moses. This is from either Exodus 15 or Deuteronomy 32, because he recorded two of them. Then they break out in a chorus, which is recorded here in the last half of verse 3 and 4, because both of Moses' songs and the martyred saints here are songs about deliverance. We should sing this song daily. Because the Lord has delivered us from the wrath to come. Romans 8, 1. Matthew 3, 7. Luke 3, 7. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and so on. Now, they, they sing a song that's called the Song of the Lamb. Interesting, isn't it? And, and after that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So the temple is again open just for a short while at this stage of the Great Tribulation. Well, the text moves on with verse 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now this is going to initiate the last seven judgments on mankind and on the earth. We, you know, we, we are given a, this stark contrast of the purity of the angels as seen in their attire and these unwholesome plagues that they're about to dispense on the earth because they're clothed in white linen and they have a golden girdle around their chest. And they're identified as the angels who have the seven plagues. Then one of the cherubim, that's the, they're using the term beast here, but it's one of the cherubim, then gives the angels the seven bowls full of God's wrath. Now remember now, the cherubim are those that are closest to God, the highest order of the celestial beings. And as a result of them receiving these bowls, the temple becomes filled with the Shekinah glory. And the temple closes until the end of the bold judgments. Now, just notice how the, the Shekinah glory is characterized as smoke and power, because, because both provide us with insight into God's workings in heaven. Just, just like Revelation eleven nineteen. now the focus is entirely on God in the temple in heaven. The temple is now closed as God separates himself from the pure sin being poured out upon the world. Revelation 16, 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways 
and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So this voice comes out of the temple in heaven telling these angels to start pouring out the seven bold judgments of the wrath of God. Now the origin of the voice is not revealed, but it is likely that it's the Lord Jesus because he was given authority to take the earth back and conduct the tribulation. And that's from Revelation 5, 7. If you remember that whole chapter, Revelation 5 was the Lord Jesus taking the scroll, being found worthy, and it is the Lord Jesus that conducts this whole tribulation. The one that took our sin upon him. And he's not going to punish us when he's going to punish the world because he took the punishment for us. So those that are believers will not be here. Uh, doesn't matter what people tell you about the timing of the rapture, folks. Jesus took our sins. He's not going to punish us when he punishes the world. So the first bold judgment now comes about in the next verse, Revelation 16, 2. And this says, And the first went, that's the angel, and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So, so this, this bowl is strategically directed at only the people who, who've aligned himself with the Antichrist, the beast. And it was prophesied back in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. Because back then it said, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So the net result of the first bowl is a is a skin ulcer or or a malignancy of the skin of some sort. And you know, some see this as the result of the probability of the nuclear war that will be taking place because you know nuclear weapons are here. They will be used during this time. It just stands to reason. It could also be caused by the radiation from those armaments. And uh we saw that a similar plague was used when God caused sores to come upon Egyptian magicians just before the Exodus. Now, this was in the ninth chapter of Exodus, verses 9 to 11. You know, the saddest observation we can make here is viewed in Revelation 16, 11. And, and the people who are receiving this burning ulcer blaspheme God all the more because of the source, and they don't repent. Oh, my goodness. They, they, they know who it is that's bringing these, and they just blaspheme him. The, the, you know, this makes the proverb that we see in Proverb 836 very, very vividly pertinent. It says there that, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Oh my goodness. The God of the universe that created everything and people hate him. My goodness. Did you ever hear the concept of biting the hand that feeds them? That's operative here too. People see what the creator is, who he is, how he's in control of everything, and they hate him. Oh, my goodness, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. So so physical and spiritual death are summarized here for all who hate Jesus. And, and they just refuse to take the eternal life he willingly offered to them. The second bold judgment comes about now in Revelation 16, verse 3. 
And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now, if you can remember back to the second trumpet, I know it's a while back, but that judgment said that one-third of all the salt water was ruined during this judgment, the remainder now of all the earth's salt water becomes blood, and all the rest of the sea life on the earth dies. Now, this kind of follows the plagues in um, Exodus 2, because in Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 to 25, that came upon Egypt for not listening to God. The stench alone would be terrible, and, and, and the ruination of the algae and the plankton and so on, um, is going to remove much, if not all, of the food supply in the water for sea life. Now, the third bold judgment is going to come now. Revelation 16, verses 4 to 7, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard... The angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them food to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Now, the remainder of the earth's fresh water sources are destroyed as they become blood, too, because um, this has the same proportions as the third trumpet judgment. One-third of the water was destroyed, and, and now the, the balance in that is ruined, too. There's now no fresh water in rivers and springs to drink. You know, there may be some potable water uh, that is in cisterns and wells and uh, that's been hidden away as the tribulation continues because to sustain life, the population needs water. There's no question about that. Um, but the guardian angel assigned to water declares the righteousness of God's judgments during this act. Since men have shed the blood of saints and prophets, mankind is given blood to drink. Isn't that interesting? Then from God's altar, this voice is heard to affirm that God's judgments are righteous. Righteous. Now here comes the fourth bowl judgment, verses 8 to 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. You know, we remember that the fourth trumpet judgment destroyed one-third of the light source, and that caused a, a partial darkening of the earth at that time. This judgment makes the sun hotter so that men on the earth are scorched with increasing temperatures. And again, those on the earth that have taken the mark, they blaspheme God all the more, and they don't repent of their sins. They are recognizing that God is doing all this to them, yet they will not repent. The fifth bowl of judgment comes about now in verses 10 and 11. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. So the fifth bowl judgment is going to result in the fourth blackout of the end times. Now, the, the entire kingdom of the beast, the Antichrist now, is going to become dark. Only the refuge areas in the three Transjordan nations where light will continue to exist is going to be. Only those 
In addition to the darkness, men are going to receive this gnawing pain that causes them to blaspheme God all the more. Now, those three Transjordan nations are Ammon, Moab, and Edom. It's modern-day Jordan, north and middle and south Jordan. There will be a thick darkness, and the darkness is so dark it can be felt. You know, darkness in the Bible represents judgment. Light represents God and his ability and desire to let us see him. Darkness is his judgment. The old Hebrew word there is choshech, choshech. And when the darkness fell in Egypt, it could be felt. It's from uh, Exodus 10, verses 21 to 23. Now, we're going to look at the last two bold judgments as we move into the eight-stage battle of Armageddon. We've seen that the Jews are going to receive their worst persecution during the last half of the tribulation, wherein two-thirds of them are going to die. Remember I said that from Zechariah 13, verses 8 to 9. The fact that even one-third of them will survive is because Michael the archangel and the chief prince. If you remember now, back to Daniel 12, verse 1, where the text there says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was during a nation even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. So, during the tribulation, there's going to be four groups of Jewish. First one is the apostate Jews, referred to as the many, in Daniel 9.27. And those are the ones that make this covenant with the Antichrist that, that starts the tribulation. They are part of the two-thirds that are going to die. The second group is the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. They're sealed and protected, and they're going to survive. And the third group is called other Jewish believers. They're compromised of, or, or comprised of some that will die and some that don't, but they become believers during the tribulation as the result of the efforts of the 144,000 evangelists. Because those folks don't take the mark. You know, if somebody takes that mark, there's no way they can undo the mark. They've made that commitment to the Antichrist. They've made their decision. They can't get back to where the people that haven't taken the mark are. The fourth group is called the faithful remnant, and that comprises the majority of the one-third that survive. Now, they're not going to accept the mark, and for most of the tribulation, they will probably be unbelievers. They are the one that Isaiah in 28.16 calls not in haste. They had nothing to do with the covenant and signing with Antichrist. Let me read that text for you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. (laughs) The fact that they will survive is found in Isaiah 10, verses 20 to 23. Where that text says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, as such are escaped out of the house of Jacob, shall no more stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. So the last verse there just states that unlike the rest of Israel, they're no longer going to lean on the one who smote them. That's the Antichrist. 
but I'm the Holy One of Israel. They've trusted God from the beginning, though not necessarily Jesus. They come to believe in Jesus at the end of the tribulation. But verse 21 declares that they will return to the God of Israel, and that can only be done through faith in the Messiah, Jesus. In spite of the numerical strength, only the remnant will return to God. Now, verses 22b and, and 23, it, it discusses some, dis, some decree of uh, destruction which has been determined among the whole earth, of which the remnant will survive. Now, these are the same words that are found in that passage of Isaiah 28, where the degree of destruction, this decree of destruction is issued with the signing of the seven-year covenant beginning the tribulation. And when we take these two passages together, it's pretty clear that the remnant will survive the persecution of the Jews by Antichrist and the mass of destruction on the earth. So Isaiah refers to them as the escaped of Israel in Isaiah 4.2, chapter 37, uh, Joel also 2.32 and Obadiah 17. Now, we are going to be discussing the protection and the provision that God makes for the remnant that encompasses the cities of refuge. We're going to see that Petra in Jordan is one of these. So uh, I just want to touch on that today because God is promising to preserve a remnant in the midst of of Antichrist's persecution in the tribulation. I'm going to read a few verses as we close today from Isaiah 41, verses 8 to 16. But thou, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken hold of from the ends of the earth and called from the corners thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that are incensed against thee shall be put to shame and confounded. They that strive with thee shall be as nothing and shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contend with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, Jehovah God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith Jehovah, and thy Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I have made thee to be a new, sharp, threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in Jehovah. Thou shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Because God is going to make a provision for them, this remnant, during the tribulation, for any of them that do not receive the mark of the beast. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, 
please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877 706 2479. That's 877 706 2479. Once again, 877 706 2479. The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. Take us there, take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there. 